Hey everybody! So in this video, what we're going to do is talk about the diffraction grating, which is really an extension of the double slits that we talked about in the previous video. So it's, it's really an extension and a nice application. So what we're going to do is, instead of illuminating two slits, what happens if we illuminate with this same laser light or light source more than two slits. In fact, many slits in the diffraction grating. Okay, so um, I remind you guys for the double slit, when we did this illumination, we found out that the maxima were given by um, d sine theta equals m lambda. This is where the maxima were, the intensity maxima. Okay, and this is going to be important as you'll see in a little bit. But I'm going to show you, again, I have a PowerPoint. It's really just two slides. You can find it on our course page. If you go to our course page, right below the uh, double slit, there's, there's uh, like I said, two slides on the diffraction grating. Okay. But if I go there, I have a picture, and I want to show you guys. I think you can see that right now. So this is what the intensity pattern uh, the, looks like. Uh, for two slits. So we've already talked about that. Uh, so the centers of these bright fringes or blobs, the exact centers of those, those are given by the d sine theta equals m lambda condition. These dark fringes that you see in between, the centers of those are given by d sine theta equals in parentheses m plus one half close parentheses times lambda, right? Well, what happens if we don't change this, the separation of the slits, but we just illuminate more than two slits? So right below here in this picture, you'll see what happens when we illuminate five slits. And what I want you guys to notice is that the positions of the centers of the bright fringes hasn't changed. So the center of that one, the center of that one, the center of that one, that one, that one. Those are given by the same condition of d sine theta equals m lambda. The centers of the dark fringes would also be given by the exact same condition that the centers are given here, right? So the centers of these bright and dark fringes haven't changed. What has changed is the width of these fringes, right? You see how the, the, the bright fringes are now more uh, centralized. The, the light doesn't spread out as much over the intensity fringe, uh, the bright fringe. It's the dark fringes have actually widened. What's happening is that more of the intensity is going closer to the center of the bright fringe instead of being spread out as much. Okay, that's key because. If we kept illuminating more and more slits, but kept the separation of the slits the same, we would find out that these bright fringes become uh, really more and more like intensity points, very bright intensity points with a really wide dark fringe in between each consecutive bright point. Okay. But the condition of where the centers of these dark fringes are and where the centers of these bright points are, though that would be the exact same conditions. Okay, so Young's double slit analysis will still tell us where the centers are. But as we illuminate more of these slits, the bright fringes right, get more and more like points. So the light doesn't spread out as much from one of these fringe centers. Okay. All right. So if I go to an extreme case like we do in the grating, what happens in the grating, and this is why we call it a grating, is that we are going to have a whole bunch of slits illuminated. Okay. Now in the grating, the separation of these slits, although we actually call them lines because they're so narrow, so the separation of these centers, and I'm doing a terrible job drawing straight lines, right? This separation here is going to be rather small. 
when we were looking at the double slit pattern, I mentioned that, yeah, for when you're doing this as a demonstration, that's usually on the order of a millimeter, half a millimeter. Well, in a grating, the D is going to be on the order of, of microns or submicron. Okay, um, so it might be half a micron of separation. And you might ask, how in the heck can you make slits, right? That are the centers of these slits are separated by such a small distance, right? Well, in an actual grating, what you really do is you have a uh, actual what we call lines so they won't really be openings so what you'll do for instance is you'll have a piece of film and you'll uh, expose it to an interference pattern and then when you develop this film in the developer um, it will be opaque except you'll have really narrow lines that are transparent or semi-transparent and they're going to be spaced really close together. Okay, so that's the way you can produce this to make a grating. So it really won't be physical openings in this opaque material because then it would just fall apart. It'll be an opaque material, a slide with these really faint um, semi-transparent lines. The width of one of the lines is going to be extremely small. Again, the width of these lines will be on the order of the separation of the lines. So these will be sub-micron uh, in, in width. But that's the way you do it. So the idea is you're going to have a whole bunch of these semi-transparent or transparent lines okay, with a really small separation distance d and again the question comes up well what happens if you send light and it fills a whole bunch of these now again in a typical grading the d is on the order of a micron or less so the angles that we're going to be seeing um, these thetas are going to be humongous relative to the double slit what i mean is they're going to be on the order of 20 degrees, 30 degrees, 50 degrees, okay? In the double slit pattern, because when you do this demonstration, L is so big, the actual angles that you're, you're using are going to be the, on the order of a few degrees, okay? So that's why the small angle approximation is fine. But for the grading, the angles are so large that we can't even really use the small angle approximation. Okay, but where the maxima are going to be located downstream on your viewing screen, you can still use this equation right here. This d sine theta equals m lambda. And, and you'll see that when I show you the PowerPoint slide. Now, you might ask, why do we do this? Okay, well, the, well let me show you the PowerPoint slide. Then I'll say why we do this. Okay, so I'm going to call up the, the, uh, the, the I guess I'll do the, the screen presentation. So this is just that first slide that we talked about. Okay, so here is a representation of the grading, a side view, just like we did for the double slit, except now I'm showing you a whole bunch of these, quote, lines, right, that are separated by distance D. And a bunch of them are being illuminated by this, this beam of light. Um, in practice, again, the D is going to be submicron, so when you have this beam of light hitting this, right, you're going to be hitting um, thousands of these lines, okay, typically. Okay, so what happens then is you're going to get these really concentrated bright fringes. They're going to look like points, okay, um, uh, or they're going to be really narrow lines um, if your beam has some um, height to it. Okay, um, and again, I'll show you this in person uh, if you if you if we get a chance to do that. All right, so these dots represent the centers of the bright fringes. I'm going to scroll that down so you can see. Okay, so these are going to represent the centers of these really uh, narrow bright fringes. 
And I don't really care about the centers of these dark fringes. That would be like right here, right here, right here. Because we really want to know where the light goes in the diffraction grating. So suppose this is just one wavelength of light. Okay, so let me, let me discuss this in terms of one wavelength like a laser beam. Then we'll talk about the real use of the grating where you have more than one wavelength. All right, anyway. Um, um, we get the, the, the great so-called grating equation is where are these bright centers. And so that's going to be given from Young's double slit analysis, d sine theta equals m lambda, right? And m, when it's a grating, we call it the order number, okay? So m equals zero or plus or minus one, plus or minus two, an integer. So for instance, m equals zero. Um, I can satisfy the grading equation with an angle of theta equals zero. Theta equals zero means straight ahead. Okay, so you're always going to get a bright point here, a, a bright uh, intensity maximum. In fact, most of the intensity uh, is going to go be right here. And that's, again, due to the fact of how light diffracts or spreads out. Okay, um, and that's m equals zero. Okay, so that would be order zero. But if you put m equal one in here, that would be this spot right here, this intensity maximum center. And that would be given by this angle. I labeled it theta 1. Okay, so we would sometimes call that the first order diffraction of the m equal 1 uh, intensity peak, the center there. Now, the intensity of that uh, really concentrated fringe is not going to be as large as the m equal 0, again, because of how light spreads out when it goes through these openings, the diffraction, all right? But the position of it is what we're interested in. Where is this bright center? And it's going to be given by the grading equation d sine theta equals m lambda. Okay, now I can put m equal 2 to look at the second order diffraction. That would be this bright point right here, and that would be angle theta 2 right there, measured from this reference axis. I should mention that you know, what determines the position of this reference axis, it's going to be the center of this beam. The center of the beam determines this reference axis, okay? All right, and again, you're going to be hitting typically um, thousands of these, okay? Um, all right, now I can do, uh, I can go to the other side, so, because it's symmetric, so this would be m equal minus 1, m equal minus 2. And in the grading equation, that would just make this angle negative. So I have a negative theta 1. I haven't drawn that in my diagram, but there's a negative theta 1 that's equal to this theta 1 absolute value-wise. And that would just be that angle for that line right there. It's the same for m equal minus 2. Okay. Uh, one other thing before we talk about the use of this, just something new to remember for a grading. The so-called grading constant is the reciprocal of the separation of these lines. So 1 over d is called the grading constant. And um, you would usually express that as number of lines per length. So typically, it would be number of lines per millimeter or number of lines per centimeter. So for example, um, there's a grading that we use for demonstration purposes. And again, I'll show it to you if I see you in person. Uh, it has a grading constant of 600 lines per millimeter. So if you just take the reciprocal of that, you will get the separation of the lines. So that's 1 600th of a millimeter, which is 1.667 microns or micrometers, which is 1667 nanometers. Okay, so again, very close, closely spaced. And if you get a chance to see the grading, we'll, we'll play around with it. Okay, now... What's the usefulness of this? I mean, it's cool to do, right? But the real usefulness of a grading is, let's say you have a source of light that has more than one frequency or wavelength in it, so different colors, right? And you want to know, okay, what wavelengths or frequencies do I have in this light? Well, you take the light uh, and collimate it, send a beam of that light through a diffraction grating, each wavelength will have its own first order diffraction angle and second order diffraction angle, okay? There's only a, a finite number of these orders. Once theta reaches 90 degrees, you can't get any more m's. 
So typically for a, a D on an actual grading, you might be able to produce second order. You might not even be able to get third order. Okay. Um, it just depends, again, mathematically. Um, once sine uh, theta hits one, you're not going to get any more order numbers. But what you do with this, this light, right, I said each color, each wavelength had the, has its own first order diffraction or second order diffraction, right? Um, now, zero works for any wavelength, right? So in other words, if you have uh, two different wavelengths, m equals zero will still be satisfied with sine theta equals zero, so theta equals zero. So if you have two wavelengths, right, there are, both of those wavelengths are going to appear in your m equals zero peak. Okay, so you don't get any separation of wavelengths if you look at m equals zero, but you will get separation of the wavelengths in first order diffraction. And usually you work in the first order. You don't really care about the second order. So if I have two wavelengths, one wavelength will have one value of theta one for m equal one. The other wavelength will have a different value of theta one for m equal one. So you actually see a separation of the wavelengths. So what you can do is if you measure the angle to the first order diffraction for a particular uh, light, you can calculate its wavelength if you know D. And that's where these guys are used. We call that a, a grading spectrometer. Oops, I'm so sorry. Okay, I, oops, I got interrupted with my phone. Um, so what you do is you put a grading in what's called a grading spectrometer. A spectrometer is an instrument that can measure the wavelength spectrum, the different wavelengths in the light. So the light hits the grading, right? In first order diffraction, different wavelengths go to different angles. There'll be a detector, right? So depending on where the light hits the detector, it'll be able to figure out what the angle is. Knowing the angle for the first order diffraction, the fact that m equals one and d will be known for the grading, the spectrometer software can figure out what the wavelength is. So you may have a particular red wavelength going to one angle, theta one. You may have a green wavelength going to a different angle, theta one, right? And again, I'll show you a demonstration of this. So the real real nice use of this grading is in a grading spectrometer where you send in unknown wavelengths of light and the grading will separate them in first order diffraction to different angles. And by measuring the angles, you can figure out the wavelengths. Okay. Now, um, I mentioned that zero order isn't useful because every wavelength will send some light straight ahead to the n equals zero. So let's say that let's say that the mixture you know, of these wavelengths is sort of a, a bluish light. So you have several different wavelengths in here mixed together. They look sort of bluish, right? A pale blue, let's say. Well, when you look at straight ahead, then the n equals zero, that's going to look pale blue because every wavelength in that original source, some of the energy at every wavelength is going to go straight ahead. And again, you'll see that if I see you in person and we do this demonstration. Okay, so that's how a grading works. Um, the main thing to remember is the grading equation and the grading constant. Let me end the show. Let me go to your summary notes and just show you guys that stuff is summarized right here, right? Very concisely. We've got the grading equation telling you where the different wavelengths go in terms of angle, right? And for order number, and then the grading constant. Um, oh, and again, let me let me emphasize that um, for the du double slit, we were able to do the small angle approximation on theta. So we were able to get the positions of the centers of the bright fringes and the dark fringes, the Y, right? We were able to actually get that. I can tell you exactly on the screen where that occurs on this Y axis. Okay, we don't do that for the grading because these angles, again, are typically very large. So the small angle approximation won't work. So you can't just say, oh, I can measure y to those points and use m lambda l over d. That won't work because these angles are so big. And the reason they're so big is because d is really, really, really small. 
And the reason we want D to be really, really, really small is because we want those bright fringes to be really concentrated. We don't want them to take up a lot of angular width. We want them to be really concentrated. So we can have a really good resolution between different wavelength peaks. Okay. All right. I'm going to stop. I'll see you in the next video. Bye-bye.